Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Shall I open our session? My name is Yasuo Suwa. Well, Uh, well, let's start our session, uh, workshop 10. Uh, my name is Yasuo Suwa. I am very pleased to participate in this session. Marco and I met 47 years ago in Bologna. From then until 2002, we worked together on many occasions. A few years after we met, we are young, as you can see in the fort on the left-hand side. At that time, there was a lot of debate about industrial relations, but autonomous work, for example, was not discussed as much as now. Time has passed. I am now as old as the picture on the right, but I hope to learn much from my young colleagues on this occasion. I look forward to a lively and stimulating presentations and comments. Now, I'd like to announce you all the audience that for the entire duration of the conference, it is possible to watch via the Marco Biagio Foundation's YouTube channel the short videos presented by the participants in the Young Scholars Postal Session. And uh, my main role is uh, timekeeping. I ask all the speakers to finish your presentation within 10 minutes. One minute before the time out, I will show you this paper. So please try to finish your presentation as far, fast as possible. And uh, as a time out, uh, at, at the ending time, I, I will show you time out uh, with us, Marcy, Marcy. Please uh, finish your presentation, conclude your presentation uh, uh, as, uh, as fast as possible. So, and now let's start our uh, uh, session from uh, uh, Dr. Giornato Cavallini, University of Milan, Bar of Milan, Italy. Her presentation title is Protecting Autonomous Work in Specific Sectors, the Case of Italian Lawyers. Please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I hope you hear me and that you can see the slides that I prepared. Do you see them? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Jonathan Cavallini. I hold a PhD in labor law at the State University of Milan, and I currently work as a labor lawyer in the Milan area. I am very glad to be here again, even in, in this strange situation, to the International Conference in commemoration 
of Professor Marco Biaggi, which is an appointment that uh, well, is very dear to me and uh, that I have been for many, for many years. Uh, today I'm here uh, to talk about a specific uh, case Dr. study. Dr. Cavarini? Yes? Yes? I can't hear your voice. You cannot hear my voice? Um, but uh, other people can. I do. Uh, okay. I do. Uh, for us, is okay. For you, is okay. Just well, tell me if. if I think. Uh, may I suggest that Francesco Fianza uh, use the chat to give uh, the moderator Yasuwasua some assistance. Uh, it must be on his end because the okay. rest of them hear you. Well, of course, technical problems are always in the at, the at every corner in this period. So, okay, I'm, I will continue. And so I'm here uh, to talk about a specific case study regarding uh, the case of Italian lawyers, not only because I am an Italian lawyer, which is, of course, it makes me easier this, uh, this task, but for some good reasons that regard the relationship between labor law and lawyers' labor. I chose these uh, two images, and I hope you can see on the screen, because, uh, um, well, there is always been some mistrust for uh, lawyers in general in society. Uh, lawyers are mostly seen as, a, as a rich, often unscrupulous and greedy people who do not deserve any labor law protection. Why on earth should the label lawyers deserve some of the statutory employment law protections if they are a strong actor on a market and they are fully autonomous workers? And this is why in this famous movie, Philadelphia, 1993, there is a famous American joke regarding lawyers that they should all be chained at the bottom of the ocean and uh, one of the most important Italian novels from the 19th century, The Betrothed, I Promessi Sposi, depicts uh, the image of the lawyer as a very unscrupulous man, uh, the uh, Azzecca Garbugli, the quibble waver, uh, a man who does not really care about uh, uh, the interests of uh, normal people, but just a greedy and bad, bad character. However, um, today in the new uh, framework of the Italian market, uh, labor lawyers should start considering also uh, lawyers as some subjects that should deserve some, la some interest from labor law. Maybe not all of the labor law protections, of course, but some interest. Uh, first of all, Italian lawyers are a lot of people. They are more, almost 250,000 people which is a very high density of lawyers. It is twice the density of German lawyers and four times the density of French lawyers, just to give an example. They are characterized by an important uh, level of precariousness and fragility, as we will see in the, following, uh, in the following slides. And we have interesting data regarding income of lawyers with significant age and gender disparities. And let, we can just consider one important number. Uh, an under 40 years old female lawyer has a, a, a medium, an average wage, an income of 15,000 euros gross per year, which is uh, far less than minimum wage in many sectors of subordinate relationships. But maybe the most important reason why Italian lawyers make a good example to test the need for protective schemes in the field of autonomous work is that in Italy, lawyers must be autonomous workers. The profession of lawyer is incompatible with any employment activity. This is an, uh, a rule coming from the forensic professional law, which means that all Italian lawyers are autonomous workers, notwithstanding the several differences that they present in the, in the market. And uh, well, this is just, uh, I will be very fast on this. These are the 
uh, data regarding income and we can see that many uh, categories of lawyers especially in the younger ages and uh, if they are female get very low uh, yearly incomes which are as we will see um, very often less than the minimum wage that is set by collective bargaining for profet for workers employees subordinate workers that uh, work in professional law firms uh, the secretaries and paralegals have uh, a minimum wage determined by collective agreements that can arrive also to more than 20,000 euros uh, for year so more than many other lawyers and they have, of course, all the benefits of an employment relationship for with respect, for example, to social security contributions that are paid mostly by the employer, while autonomous worker carry all of the costs of social security contribution. And they have, of course, all the well known rights of statutory employment law, rest, holiday permissions, extra time work, compensations. Uh, not without mentioning unemployment benefits after the end of the relationship. Um, lawyers, and you could say, well, of course, they are employees, they are subordinate, while lawyers are autonomous workers, so why should they deserve some of the protections of uh, labor law, of statutory employment law? Well, actually, the data shows that, that many Italian lawyers find themselves in a condition of economic dependency both towards big institutional clients uh, such as banks and insurance companies both uh, for the law firm they work for uh, which substantially treat uh, the lawyers working in the firm as employees we can find this data for example 20 percent of italian lawyers do not carry any investment cost which means that they work solely solely for the work for the law firm they they collaborate with and uh, fifth, more or less 50% of italian lawyers do not own their own law firm they work for other lawyers and they find themselves in a condition of dependency professor razzolini wrote some years ago uh, which who is a, a deep uh, has a deep knowledge of the italian market even with respect of the autonomous work sector, that the technical and organizational modalities used by big law firms makes it difficult to imagine that there is any reason to sustain that uh, these professionals cannot present the character of subordination, of an employment relationship. In other jurisdictions, there is no legal obstacle to the constitution of an employment or quasi-employment relationship between a lawyer and a law firm. We have employed lawyers in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in Spain. While in Italy, we have this rule that I already mentioned that a lawyer must be an autonomous worker. Uh, this is a very ancient rule coming from uh, uh, the Roman tradition. Uh, a, ro uh, a medieval uh, a jurist, Bartolo da Sassoferrato, wrote uh, in uh, the 14th century that between a lawyer and a client there is not a working relationship of course in latin it would be locatio with reference to the scheme of the locatio operis and locatio operarum and uh, throughout history we have this idea that lawyers are not really workers they are some kind of uh, intellectuals of professionals who are not expected to be paid. Of course, this is not true. A, work, a lawyer would ask money for his work or her work, and it is a worker, but still they are underprotected. They are underprotected due to the fact that, as we know, autonomous work is oftenly not covered by the most important rules and protections of the employment uh, uh, relationship. And here you can find some of the many, many, many uh, judgments of Italian case law stating this. However, what are the protective remedies that today uh, Italian lawyers can enjoy uh, without claiming the reclassification of the employment relationship, which is simply not possible under Italian positive law as of today? Uh, we have the general protection of the lawyer as a self-employed worker 
And so law number 81 of 2017, which is the so-called statute of uh, autonomous work, we have specific protections for lawyers in the forensic professional law regarding the prohibition of vexatious clauses and the introduction of the principle of just compensation. And now, very recently, the, the legislator is thinking about a shift of paradigm through the proposal, the legislative proposal, to introduce the figure of the subordinate lawyer, which is something that in Italy we never had. Uh, I think that the time is running very fastly, so I will go to the conclusive remark, and then, of course, in the debate, maybe we could go a little bit more in depth with the uh, the things that, that I mentioned, but 10 minutes is, of course, a very, a very fast time. Um, we need, this is the result, the result of the research that you can find, of course, in the paper with all the references, is uh, that uh, many lawyers do want to be or to become truly self-entrepreneurs, and they just deserve some minimal protection against the abuses of the market and the possible of abuses of some strong counterparties. I always mention banks and insurance companies who are able to impose the terms of the transaction. But some lawyers who actually work as, empl as employees may deserve today, at least in the Italian scenario, the protections of a subordinate worker, and there is really no reason not to grant them that protection. And so uh, this is the, the, the final idea is that lawyers are not so bad people. They do not deserve to be all uh, at the bottom of the ocean, as in that movie Philadelphia that I mentioned at the beginning. And we cannot uh, actually allow thousands of lawyers to be chained in an empty space of law. And uh, I hope that I stayed into the 10 minutes. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonata Cavarini. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstand your uh, gender. Sorry. Uh, and uh, the second speaker is uh, Matteo Avogaro, Eurofound Ireland. Uh, you, your presentation uh, title is Income Protection in, in the Framework of Liberal Professions. A pathway harmonized the conditions in a common market. Please uh, uh, start your presentation. Yes, thank you, Professor. And can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Matteo, we can okay. hear you. Okay, thank you, because I had some problems, uh, connection problems before. So I'm happy that you can hear me. So uh, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I thank you, the Marco Biaggi Foundation, for this opportunity to be here also this year to share my research and discuss with you. Uh, so, uh, let's go uh, to the presentation. So, we are talking about income protection and income support, income support policies for liberal professions. And uh, we are looking for some solutions and to try to reply to the question if there is a pathway for a coordinated condition in the European carbon market. Uh, the first step is to define uh, about uh, who we are talking about. So who are liberal professionals in Europe? Well, first of all, uh, we have to say that there is no a unique uh, definition in the, in the European Union, in the European legislation about liberal professionals. There are some judgments of the European Court of Justice. They are mentioned also in uh, one directive, the Directive on the Recognition of Professional Qualifications. But uh, I assumed as a definition to, uh, to indicate a limit to my research, uh, I took the definition that has been given by the European Economic and Social Committee in 2014. I summarized here the most important points that define the liberal professionals, but substantially we can say that they are those that are working in a regulated profession and they are subject to the oversight of an external body like a professional body. So, uh, the second step is to say, um, my colleague Cavallini said correctly that uh, lawyers in Italy are underprotected. 
Uh, my focus is to try to understand what are the impact of this underprotection in the economic and income condition, not only on lawyers, but of liberal professionals in Europe. Utilizing the microdata provided by Eurofound and by the European Working Conditions Survey of 2019, that are the last available, uh, I um, present some findings. Uh, first of all, to the question about uh, considering all my effort, the achievement in my job, I don't get pay, I feel I don't get paid appropriately. There are 25.5% of the sample, and the sample is composed by self employed without employees with a tertiary education degree, because there was not a question directly uh, based on liberal professional, but the sample of self-employed self without employees with a tertiary education degree could be considered a sample in which there are most of the weaker self, uh, liberal professionals. So 25.5% uh, said that they feel they don't get paid appropriately. 28.3% of the same sample said that their household find troubles to make ends. And maybe the more interesting data, uh, still in the sample of self-employed without employees with a tertiary education degree, we see the income level. And these uh, information are useful because I assume are important because there are people that effectively declare during the interview what is their monthly income. And we see that uh, considering a uh, uh, the bracket in which the income could be considered low for a liberal professional, we have below the threshold of 1,500 euros per month net income. Uh, in France, 23%, in Italy, 35.3% of the respondents, in Spain, 59.1% of the respondents. So, what are the assumptions that we can make on the basis of this data? Uh, we can say that there are some weak liberal professionals, and there are um, those in which uh, I concentrated my research. Not all the liberal professionals, some of them are really well off professionals that don't have income and uh, uh, don't, they don't need to specific protections. But there, are a, there is a category of weaker professional, liberal professional, that need to be protected. And uh, with reference to this category, uh, the idea is to try to develop uh, some, to develop, to find some solutions that could provide them uh, with uh, an income support. When we talk income support policies, we are talk I'm starting about, I'm starting from the definition that has been given from the, for the German Institute for Labor Economics, the ISA in Bonn, that talks about uh, a wide definition of income support policies, including minimum wages, social security contribution, taxes, and cash benefits. Uh, since we saw before that liberal professionals, and in particular weak liberal professionals, are a peculiar group of workers, there are some elements that we can consider when we are talking about an income support policy. And uh, that there are some policies that, are, that have a direct effect, minimum compensation, other policies that have an indirect effect, I said uh, protecting liberal professionals in a condition of economic dependency, and social security measures. With reference to these three kinds of measures, I develop a com um, comparative legal analysis concerning France, Italy, and Spain. About direct and indirect measures, the result of the inquiry of the research showed that in the three countries there are specific structured juridical frameworks to increase the protection of the weak liberal professionals. And it is the fire compensation in Italy, in Italian is equo compenso, so the translation in English is fair compensation. And the target of these policies are liberal professionals providing services for strong customers and um, with reference uh, to strike customers, we mean banks, uh, uh, assurance companies, multinational companies, in case the condition of the agreement are set unilaterally by these customers. And in this case, we have some direct measures, minimum compensation linked to flexible parameters, and indirect measures that are rules that allow unfair contract terms to be declared void. The TRADE in Spain, TRADE because it is the Spanish pronunciation, that has as a target a liberal professional providing services for a minor customer uh, that are getting 75% or more of their income from the same customer. And here there are still 
direct emissions, minimum compensation set by acquerdos uh, de interest professional that are some not collective agreements, but agreements made by association representing these workers that are anyway self-employed that are executed with the companies to which they, were, they provide most of their service and indirect measures, right calls required for customers termination. So limits to terminate the uh, professional agreement. And the third uh, solution that I identified is the Avocat Collaborator Liberal. This is a third different target because uh, the protection here is provided by a liberal professional providing services for a professional firm. Obviously the target here are the lawyers but uh, it could be extended also to other kind of professionals. And here the direct measures are minimum compensation for young liberal professional to first years of practice that are set mandatorily by a provision taken by the lawyer's professional body. And in direct measures uh, consisting mainly in a mandatory notice to terminate the collaboration, so a notice period, and the right to develop a personal network of customers using the resources of the firm. So the professional can work for the firm, but at the same time develop a personal network of customers to allow him to increase the income and also to sustain him in case he would stop working for the firm. About the third aspect, social security measures, there is not too much to say, except for Spain, because in Italy and France, in general, uh, liberal professionals are not covered by public schemes of social security measures. They, can, they have their private social security agency that are not providing any way a protection similar to the ones of public protection schemes, and in particular, not an insurance against involuntary unemployment. That was the focus of this research. In Spain, there is an interesting opt-in scheme that allows liberal professionals to decide at the beginning of their career if they want to be covered by the public protection uh, social security scheme that is uh, providing a stronger protection and an insurance against unemployment. Here there are the condition maximum 24 months and between uh, 550 euros and 900 euros per month. And or by the private uh, social security agency for professionals and this one requires low contributions to be paid, low social security contribution, but they provide low protection and no protection against involuntary unemployment. So this is more or less the most important solution that we have found. Uh, two words, really two words about if this solution could be considered uh, uh, compatible with EU antitrust law. Mainly, yes. The only problem is about the minimum compensation tariffs. So the implant of the schemes that we saw in Italy, in France, and in Spain are in general compatible with European uh, uh, antitrust law. The only problem is about uh, the minimum compensation threshold that could be set in these uh, three uh, schemes, three structured uh, framework of protection. And in this case, I don't go into the details, then we can discuss it during the debate because there is no time, but we have to say that according to uh, the, the case law of the Court of, Euro um, Court of Justice of the European Union, there are some cases, and in particular cases, uh, in which uh, uh, the case laws say overriding reasons relating to the public interest, minimum compensation threshold to protect the weakest uh, le liberal professional are admitted. So the general idea that there is in some countries that uh, minimum uh, compensation threshold, the minimum compensation are not admitted for uh, a liberal professional is not totally true. There are some cases in which they are admitted and some cases that are the ones that we considered before. Going to the conclusions, uh, what we can uh, uh, obtain from this research and this analysis? That there are some core principles that inspire the different solutions found in the three countries that have been compared that could be considered the base of a core structure of protection to increase the, the protection and the, the improve the condition of liberal professionals, weaker liberal professionals that we saw in the, uh, in the market and in general in the society. And this protection are four kinds of protection. A protection against unfair contract terms imposed by strong customers that we said before, so by banks, by big insurance companies, by 
multinational companies. So when the professional provides service for this company, has to be protected by exploitation by these companies that could impose unfair contract terms. The second point is prevent sudden and justified interruptions by the customer or the firm to which the professional is working with of a service agreement that go to the detriment, to the detriment of the liberal professional. So uh, provide an assurance to the liberal professional that at least he will have a notice before the interruption of the professional agreement. It's not always this, the case in Europe. An opt-in scheme for the national public insurance against involuntary unemployment on the model that has been seen in Spain, and a minimum compensation threshold to avoid forms of social dumping. This is the most critical aspect because it could be in contrast with the European antitrust law, but there is room to introduce this uh, solution in cases in which the condition of liberal professional is effectively exploited. So, final uh, point. What strategy it is the best to introduce this solution at the European level? So I examined in the paper, you can read it there, or you, we can discuss afterwards why the European legislation is not the best way. And I propose a solution, the one of the European semester. The European semester is a tool that has been developed in the framework of the Economic and Monetary Union. So a tool for coordination of tax and economic policies has been integrated, strongly integrated, by the request of the European Commission with the European pillar of social right to create a more social European semester, to increase the social cohesion and social protection in Europe, so to make the European semester become an instrument effectively to increase social protection in Europe. And so this instrument that basically consists in some guidelines that are set by recommendation that the Commission and the Council of the European Union send every year to each country and on the basis of which each country has to develop a, a national program of reforms responding to these guidelines. So this has been socialized and integrated some, integrating some principles of the European pillar of social rights, we can yeah, imagine that some of the guidelines, the core principles that I highlighted before to increase the condition of a deliberate professional could be uh, introduced as a common pathway to coordination in the European, uh, the European 27 countries. So here I summarize the concluding remarks that I've already said. So I think I can stop here. And if you have further questions, I'm open to reply to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Matteo Avogaro. The third uh, presenter is uh, 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 Professor uh, Roberto Troisi, Troisi, University uh, of Salerno, Italy. Yeah. Uh, your uh, presentation title is New Criteria versus Old Autonomy quality and efficiency inside the courts. Yes, Thank you very I, much for your participation. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to point out that I am Francesca Mendola because we had, um, um, she couldn't make it, so uh, I'm here to, you know. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, Francesca. Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I took my PhD with Professor Tindara Dabo at the Marco Biaggi Foundation. So it's really, really nice to, to be back. Um, well, I present a paper um, that I wrote with Professor Roberta Trovisi and Gaetano Alfano. Uh, the title of our paper is New Criteria Against Old Autonomy, the Measurement and Implementation of NPM Standards in the Criminal Italian Judiciary. So basically, we are speaking about the, the uh, Italian scenario. Uh, okay, so uh, we started from a critical issue, which is the application of the new public management parameters to some branches of the public sector, um, specifically to the judiciary. Why the judiciary? Because uh, it belongs to the public area where difficulty in applying NPM parameters is much more evident. It is more evident because basically any focus on the measurement of the performance with the aim of improving the judicial activities can risk clashing with the necessary protection of courts autonomy. 
So, um, generally speaking, okay, sorry. Uh, generally speaking, in Europe and in Italy, uh, there has been the introduction of NPM practices in the judiciary, and almost all of them can be seen as a form of interference with the judge decision making autonomy. Uh, all those parameters were normally aimed at guarantee the functioning, the good functioning of the courts. Uh, so basically, most of those parameters were about uh, efficiency. So this is why our first objective has been to measure efficiency by taking into account the implication of autonomy in the court's work organization. We also have a second objective of the research, which is, uh, of course, strictly connected to, uh, to the first one, and it's about human resources practices. Why? Because basically any legislative initiative about parameters could uh, uh, turn very easily into new human resources practices. So we also aim to verify whether autonomy as a job characteristics leads to a general resistance to change or if different contexts with different degrees of efficiency can show different degrees of resistance to change. And along this way, we also wanted to understand if uh, resulted oriented parameters translated in human resources practices could show an absolute resistance to change or a relative one, of course, taking into account the nature of the change and con contextualized for the degree of efficiency. So basically, our main concept of analysis has been autonomy. Uh, we use autonomy as a criterion of horizontal work division that currently uh, address a proper measurement of the efficiency. I'm going to show you in a bit that we distinguish between uh, courts and prosecutors uh, in the Italian judiciary. We also treated uh, autonomy as a work characteristic related to the degree of resistance to change regarding any institutional reform. So basically we distinguish between high resistance and lower resistance as for its degree and absolute and relative resistance as for the nature of the change. What, we, what, do, what did we expect? We, we expect that absolute resistance should occur to any kind of reform at the same time and it should be expressed with the highest degree of resistance. On the contrary, relative resistance should be sensitive to the, kind of, to the kind of change, of course, and it should show a lower degree of resistance. So regarding our empirical model, we follow three, step, three steps. Sorry. The first one was uh, aimed at testing the prosecutors and courts efficiency. As I said before, we use autonomy as an horizontal criterion uh, of uh, labor division so we treated um, prosecutors and courts as different units of professional bureaucracy. Uh, basically, in Italy, they also have these different functions, so we thought it was a good idea. Uh, the second step uh, of the model uh, aimed at testing the degrees of resistance to change according to the context. And the third one was dedicated to the acceptance of result-oriented human resources practices. So, uh, first of all, regarding prosecutors and courts efficiency, uh, we uh, use data uh, from the Italian Ministry of Justice and we performed a direct, direct, directional distance function uh, that allowed us to individuate efficient decision making units. So, as you can see, we were able to individuate four different groups. Uh, the first one is composed by efficient tribunals, so you have efficient courts and efficient prosecutors. Uh, while the fourth one is uh, composed by inefficient tribunals. And then you have group two and group three, which are in between the first two. Um, okay, uh, regarding resistance to change and human resources practices, uh, we use the resistance to change scale questionnaire um, that we administer to 800 judges and prosecutors. <clears throat> And we also added a supplementary question to the questionnaire to test the, uh, let's just say, the level of acceptance of the human resources practices. So uh, the question was, do you agree with the introduction of reward-based incentives related to judicial efficiency? Uh, okay, here you have the results. I don't know how much you can see, but basically we tested the resistance to change and the acceptance of human resources practices within the four different contexts of efficiency. 
uh, I will just briefly tell you the main, the most important results. So first of all, to um, the DDF results confirm the idea to measure efficiency, taking into account the two different composition of Italian tribunals. So I'm here referring to the four group that I showed you uh, before. So basically to distinguish between prosecutors and courts was, um, let's just say, a good idea. Uh, regarding the results of the resistance to change and the human resources practices, I will just tell you the, the most important So um, for the timing. So um, in group four, we, which was composed by inefficient tribunals, um, we found the highest RTC score uh, of all the sample and 40% of the sample, the 45% of the sample disagrees with human resources practices. So in this case, we individuate an absolute resistance to change, which corresponds to a low efficiency. On the contrary, in group one, which is composed of efficient tribunals, uh, we found an intermediate degree of resistance to change and a general tendency to contemplate some type of change. So in this case, we have relative resistance to change and high efficiency. Uh, then we have the results of group two of group three, but I will go Okay, so trying to summarize the results, we can say that in inefficient contexts, so in our case group four, uh, we have the highest RTC score of all the sample. So basically, um, inefficient contexts normally show an absolute resistance to change. Uh, on the contrary, efficient tribunals, so in our case group one, tend to have a lower degree of resistance to change. Um, well, I just wanted to point out some of our contributions. Of course, this is still a preliminary analysis, so we are sort of still working on it, but we really wanted to raise the, uh, the, the issue of the introduction of NPM parameters in the judiciary. Uh, what we did is to measure efficiency taking into account autonomy as a criterion of horizontal division of labor. So as I said before, we distinguish between prosecutors and courts. Uh, we treated autonomy as a work characteristics which can influence resistance to change in the public sector. And finally, we tested how our reward-based system is esteemed, considering both efficiency and resistance to change. Um, I will just conclude with two uh, issues that I think could be interesting for the discussion. Uh, so, first of all, uh, in our research, we conclude that it's not conceivable a generalized introduction of NPM parameters with a single recipient being the whole public administration. Why? Because basically, public administration expresses different organizational identities, and often uh, it, it also has different functions. So, we cannot think to just introduce the same NPM parameters in all the public areas. Uh, judiciary in this case was basically just an example. The second one is about the Italian judiciary, so I would say the Italian scenario, because basically even if um, it's necessary to find a balance between efficiency and autonomy, to date in Italy apparently the solutions seem to be much more in favor of judge's unconditional protection. Um, it is also true that to uh, create a reform process, we have to take into account the participation of judges. So I would say that in Italy, we are sort of still working on the, uh, on the application of the NPM parameters um, in the judiciary. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Roberto Toizi, uh, uh, thank you very much for your time keeping <laughs> and a, a good time management. Thank you. And uh, the fourth uh, uh, speaker is, is uh, Professor Mel Eriksson, University of Tartu, Estonia. And uh, the title is the Impact of the COVID-19 Crisis on Bogus Autonomous Work. Please uh, uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. As I already mentioned, my presentation is about the um, impact of the COVID-19 crisis on bogus autonomous work. So during the um, 
first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of restrictions were introduced to reduce human contacts. And in order to mitigate uh, uh, the effects of restrictions on workers and enterprises, both the state and the employers took measures to protect employees' income and jobs. For example, in the case of uh, Estonia, the state paid wage compensation during Bruce's employees for loss of wages and uh, employers reduced wages in order to pre prevent dismissal of um, employees. Here is the next slide. Uh, the peniculerity of Estonia was also about the measures taken to maintain employees' income or job did not cover persons working under the civil law contracts, mainly under construct of mandate of contract of war services, that is, independent contractors. Uh, they had no guarantees in a crisis, a crisis situation at all. Therefore, a widespread debate arose whether these were genuine civil law contracts or whether they were in fact employment contracts. Both employees and employers pointed out that the wrong choice of contract puts them in a difficult situation on labour market. And this caused the legal disputes over the determination of the nature of the contract and prompt the social partners to look for ways to reduce focus autonomous work. Uh, it should be mentioned that um, the problem concerning focus autonomous work is not uh, new in Estonia. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, simply highlighted more sharply this, uh, this, uh, this problem. So I studied what is the impact of uh, the COVID-19 crisis on focus autonomous work. Other criteria for identifying employee employment contract become more precise, but measures are being taken to prevent of, uh, the conclusion of civil law contracts instead of uh, labor, law, uh, labor law contracts. So the first issue. In several decisions, the Estonian Supreme Court has found that in order to determine the type of contract, it is important to examine the extent to which the worker is subordinate to the party providing the work. Uh, however, in recent decades, uh, the nature of employment relationships has uh, diversified a number of new forms of work have been introduced, but remain within the boundaries uh, of labor law and uh, and uh, sorry and, and civil law. And it has been found that the legal discussion uh, about the classical approach to the definition uh, of employment relationships is not enough because it may be not help to identify persons who need protection in an employment relationship. For example, it has been found that um, more attention needs to be paid to criterion of employee dependency. So, analyzing the decisions of uh, labor dispute uh, bodies, labor dispute committees and courts, concerning the nature of employment contracts uh, uh, in the period uh, from May uh, last year to March this year, I can be concluded that these are typical disputes concerning the determination of the nature of an employment relationship in resol resolution of which the labor dispute bodies have uh, relied on the existence of a criterion of subordination uh, and labor dispute Bodies have not used new approaches to identifying the nature of employment relationship. So, although the implementation of measures to mitigate the restrictions imposed due to COVID-19 slowly on employees sharply raised the debate in society about the real nature of civil law contracts, this issue is not uh, reflected in decisions of labor disputes bodies. Uh, I think this can be explained by the fact that um, mm, uh, the measures were applied for, for a short time and it was not uh, considered reasonable to challenge uh, the nature of the employment relationship. 
So, in addition to the issue of identifying the nature of employment relationship, there was an active debate on uh, how to uh, how to make employment regulation more in interest of the parties in order to prevent the conclusion on unjustified civil law contracts. So, making the regulation of labor relations more flexible is also seen as an opportunity to reduce uh, bogus autonomous work. Uh, the discussion, the discussion was uh, initiated by the social partners and basically considered uh, it a priority to start increasing working time flexibility. That means the introduction of uh, regulation of on call work for minimum maximum contracts in Estonia where the parties to the employment relationship agree on the range on working hours in which the employee will work. And the Estonian social partners and government have decided to introduce the regulation on on-call work as a pilot project in Estonia, which means that the rules will only apply to the trade sector for two to three years. After that, an assessment will be made whether the implementation of such form of work is appropriate uh, in, in Estonia. And the second issue that uh, arose uh, um, uh, as the COVID crisis increased the use of telework, there was also made a proposal to change the rules about uh, occupational health and safety of teleworkers. Uh, it was found that uh, the employer is not able to fulfill all the obligation relevant, uh, uh, all the relevant obligations, and the employer should only inform the employee about possible risk factors and to provide employees with uh, suitable tools and to instruct teleworkers. Uh, but this proposal is not being resolved yet. So, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the clear link between the content of employment regulation and focus autonomous work. Uh, so, the less the regulation of employment relations takes into account the interest of parties to employment law contract, uh, that is, the more rigid, uh, more rigid uh, uh, the regulation of labor relations is, the more uh, unjustified civil law contracts uh, are concluded. And uh, in conclusion, the COVID-19 crisis showed very clearly the consequences of using focus autonomous work. It is remarkable that the problem was addressed by the social partners uh, who don't usually play a significant role in shaping labor relations in Estonia and uh, activities in this area will continue and time will tell whether focus autonomous work reduces as a result of measures um, taken. So I try to be uh, quite short and thank you very much for your attention for listening. Thank you very much uh, Professor Amelie Eriksson uh, and uh, the last uh, speaker is uh, Professor Stephen D, University of California, Irvine School of Law, uh, United States of America. Uh, his uh, uh, presentation title is Entrepreneurial Realism in the Age of Workplace Enforcement. Uh, please uh, uh, start your presentation. Thank you.
Sorry, we can hear you and also maybe we can hear you, but it's really, really uh, low. So maybe if you can turn up the volume of your microphone. If you get um, near your uh, laptop, we can hear from the distance, but I think that you have selected the wrong microphone. So maybe if you would like to follow me uh, on the bottom right, you have a purple uh, button that opens you a panel in the set, uh, the last uh, icon of this panel is settings. Maybe it's better if you click on set up your camera and microphone to test your microphone again. You have to turn up. Can you hear me now? We hear you in the distance. I still hear you very distant. I don't know if any other can hear you better, but no, we can hear very far, as if uh, he were far away from the mic. Seems to be the same problem I had the other day. Um, how, how about with this corded mic? Now we hear you. Thank you. Now you hear me. Oh, okay, great. Great. Okay. So, you know, we're only a year into this pandemic. You would think that I would have figured out the technology by now. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Let me see if get back to my slides. Uh, okay. So my apologies for uh, the technical difficulties. Thank you to the organizers. I wish we could be together to discuss this in person, uh, but mostly I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm hoping that everyone is, is safe and um, staying healthy. So uh, I'm a legal scholar. I uh, research and write about questions related to immigration. And within that body of work, there's a very focused and well-defined conversation about immigrant workers. Now, uh, there are many reasons for this, economic, uh, political, and legal. But the larger point that I want to make is that, by contrast, there is a very uh, uh, narrow or uh, undeveloped conversation about immigrant entrepreneurs in the legal scholarship space. Now, a part of why this is interesting is because, as many of you know, in the social sciences, immigrant entrepreneurialism is very well covered. Number number of people for decades have uh, discussed and documented and theorized immigrant entrepreneurialism. 
Um, so my project is to try to focus our attention uh, as legal scholars on immigrant entrepreneurs and to get a sense of uh, what insights we might be able to garner. Now, if uh, you came to the United States and you spent time in a major city like Los Angeles or New York, uh, if you uh, ask someone what they thought of when they thought of an immigrant entrepreneur, you might think of something like this, like a restaurant. Um, even if you didn't visit a city like this and you were just paying attention to the national news, you might think of uh, uh, dreamers. These are um, high achieving uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States. Uh, many of whom have uh, engaged in entrepreneurial and business activity. Um, but my interest is in a, a different category of immigrant entrepreneur, and that is what I call street vendors. So these are people who do not work in a brick or mortar restaurant. They are not people who work in an office. They're people on the street who provide a basic, uh, who meet the basic food and daily needs of people who live in a community. So when you focus on uh, street vendors, uh, you develop uh, uh, an interesting and uh, set of insights about entrepreneurialism. So let me just go ahead and um, uh, begin with that part of my talk. Uh, in particular, I would like to focus on um, this movement to decriminalize street vending. So there's a long history of street vending in the United States. Uh, there's a long history in Southern California where I live. And uh, in many ways, this speaks to the availability of work at the bottom of the labor market. So this has to do with um, value that's generated through cash exchanges, and they largely fit within regulatory gaps. Um, for a number of years and in many cities, street vending was regulated primarily through public health laws, public safety laws, but mostly it reflected the political influence of, uh, of the restaurant industry and chambers of commerce who are tied to brick and mortar restaurants. Um, in the last several years, there has been a push to decriminalize street vending, uh, again, in part because um, police were doing a lot of the work in terms of um, enforcing these laws. Now, uh, this of course has been challenging in an era where there are so many undocumented or unauthorized immigrants and so few opportunities to obtain legal status. So the threat of coming into contact with the police raised uh, a number of concerns and fears for people in the immigrant community. So this prompted the state of California to pass what's known as the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act. This was passed in 2018. And what was important about this law was that it replaced criminal penalties for sidewalk vending with non-criminal or administrative penalties. So the idea was that uh, instead of being arrested or having your, uh, your cart seized and taken by the state, uh, rather you would receive a fine and it was um, based in part on your ability to a pay as opposed to um, a set of uh, increasing fines that could lead to uh, jail time. Um, okay, so this is the sort of like broad brushstrokes, happy to talk more during the debate. Um, if you look at the example of uh, safe sidewalk vending in, the, in California and decriminalizing uh, street vending, uh, we yield a number of interesting insights about immigrant entrepreneurialism uh, as legal scholars. Uh, and there are three insights, what I call immigration, the, the, the salience of immigration enforcement, the continuing salience of immigration enforcement, uh, policing public spaces, and racialization. So let me just talk about each in turn. So the first key insight is that so much of economic and social life uh, is tied to uh, immigration enforcement and uh, the effort by immigrants to try to fit into those spaces that are untouched by immigration law. So since 1986, uh, uh, employers have been required to check and verify the immigration status of their workers. This is on the left, you see an image of what's known uh, as the form, the I-9 form. Uh, and this is something that each employee has to fill out before getting a job and they have to provide documentation, which you see on the right, driver's license, social security card, et cetera. Um, and what's important about this is that uh, this law, this 1986 law is tied to uh, uh, employers and the employer worker relationship. Um, 
this law does not reach entrepreneurs who don't work for others, but rather work for themselves as the saying goes. So because they are working for themselves, they are independent contractors and therefore do not ever have to show or produce proof of authorized status. They don't have to show their documentation. So um, that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, immigrants, especially um, poor immigrants, find themselves in the entrepreneurial space. Um, you know, not when people think about entrepreneurs, they often think of sort of Silicon Valley and these very high skilled uh, elite entrepreneurs. Uh, this is a, a similar sort of dynamic, except taking place on the bottom. You're, you're trying to fill in these uh, gaps in the economy that are left untouched by the law. So that's the first insight, the continuing salience of immigration enforcement in the lives of immigrants. Um, there's a second insight, and this has to do with policing public space. Uh, so under the U.S. Constitution, uh, uh, there are a number of amendments, and the amendments all articulate various individual rights. The Fourth Amendment uh, articulates the individual right to be free from searches and seizures by uh, the state, uh, uh, unless the state has some sort of reason in the form of a warrant. Uh, but what's important to note is that state power is... Um, much less constrained in a public space than in a private space. So if you think about uh, a workplace from the perspective of criminal law, you as a worker have far fewer protections working in a public space than in a, an office building. So uh, you see here a police officers just questioning someone on the street. Um, if you translate that into the work context, you see on the left, you have a street vendor uh, who's there and um, under a, a wide range of conditions, a police officer would have the power to uh, interrogate him and ask him questions. On the right, you see someone working within uh, a building. And typically, you cannot, as a police officer, cannot enter that space under the Fourth Amendment without consent of the employer. So just um, if we look, about, look at this uh, example of street vending from the perspective of uh, criminal procedural protections, you see that street vendors are much more vulnerable than people who typically work within a brick and mortar store or a workspace. Okay, finally, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about racialization. So uh, you have the same sort of pictures here. Um, what's uh, important to note is that uh, because street vending had been so criminalized, uh, there's a, a sort of um, stigma or deviance that's attached to this kind of work. And so some of the work that uh, decriminalization is doing is to try and denaturalize that deviance to try and show that uh, there's a kind of identity formation that takes place vis-a-vis um, -vis criminal law. And if you can get criminal law out of the picture, then you might be able to reduce the more harmful impacts of racialization. Um, more broadly, I should say that this also connects street vending to um, other more uh, uh, you know, common and, and harmful pictures that are uh, circulated uh, in the media. So this is one of workers uh, who are arrested in a poultry processing plant. And the point here is that, again, all of these sort of work opportunities fit within this broader structure of, of racialization. Okay, now I'm coming to the end of time, so let me just very briefly conclude um, with this larger question about economic productivity. And I think this is um, you know, a common theme in much of our Im uh, immigration scholarship. And, and political dis discourse that often a defense that people mount for immigrants is to emphasize their economic productivity, to emphasize all that they contribute. But it's also important to know that oftentimes this is sideswiped by uh, concepts of criminal deviance. So in other words, President Obama uh, famously talked about the need to protect um, you know, families, not felons, people who work uh, uh, to contribute, not people who are um, causing violence, um, as if those are two completely mutually exclusive categories. Um, and uh, if we think about street vendors as immigrant entrepreneurs, it creates opportunities to put the struggle of immigrants in a much broader context. So just to give you an example, um, you know, as many of you know, uh, America continues to struggle with uh, racial violence by the police against uh, Black Americans. Uh, and this is a picture of Eric Garner, who was arrested and then killed by the police for illegally send it, uh, selling uh, cigarettes. Again, this is a classic form of street vending. It was, again, a form of entrepreneurialism, but that part was uh, de-emphasized because of the illegality of selling 
of cigarettes. So again, part of what this street vending example shows is the arbitrary nature in which certain activities are characterized as uh, deviant and others are characterized as productive. Okay, uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, now uh, we will have the last uh, speaker, a uh, dis discussant, Professor Ricardo Salomone, University of Trento Marco Biagi Foundation. Okay, could you please uh, uh, start your presentation? Thank, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Yashu, and nice to see you again. Uh, let me begin by, by thanking the, the Marco Biaggi Foundation for the invitation and the opportunity to contribute to, to the discussion today. Um, uh, since I've got limited time, I, my commentary is primarily to the audience and only secondarily for, for the panelists. And to this end, I, I make two main points. I would like to start with a few words uh, about the quality of papers presented in this session. Uh, I really appreciated variety of topics covered, depth of analysis and, and somehow critical thinking. Uh, and all that we have had so far confirms that, that quality. Uh, but uh, this is my first point. I would like to stress a fundamental uh, methodological issue. Uh, properly understanding uh, the advantages and limitation of non-law methods. I mean methods used by economists, sociologists, political scientists, and, and so on, uh, clarifies the value they can add to analysis of law issues and, and questions. And equally important, it, it underscores how lawyers approach uh, uh, can complement, but never, never replace alternative methods used in other disciplines. Uh, from my point of view, uh, violations, uh, transgressions of disciplinary uh, boundaries uh, are always welcome. Our understanding uh, of the main topic of the conference, uh, protecting autonomous work, is, is enriched by, by different styles of research, um, label lawyers, lawyers in general, and other scholars uh, should put together and mix more and more the diversity of their approaches uh, instead of rejecting what is done in, in other uh, disciplines. Mm, I'm thinking uh, about measurement and implementation of, of NPM standards. Francesca outlines an, a sharp conclusion. Uh, resistance to change is higher in low efficiency context, uh, while the most productive ones do not show the lowest level of resistance to change. Uh, the role of judges seems to have transformed the concept of autonomy. Uh, Francesca, I agree with you. Autonomy is an instrumental value uh, yes. and not an end in itself. Uh, your conclusion is the perfect incipit for an interdisciplinary paper dealing with the topic of our conference and, and able to mix your methodology with normative or, or legal approach. I'm thinking about Stephen's paper also. I agree with you. The street vending example illustrates how uh, states, legislators, uh, authorities can affect uh, immigration law in the less direct ways and illustrates how we can use law to remove obstacles uh, to participating in the economic life of our community. Uh, but law is not omnipotent. And therefore, I also agree with you, Stephen, with reference to the fact that the employee status could not address the core problems in immigrants' lives, like humiliation and subordination tied up in, in working as non-white immigrant workers. Um, relationships between central government and, and states, regions, or municipalities are crucial factors, actually, not only within the, the US legal system. 
in relation to this aspect, Stephen, I, I, would, uh, I would like to ask you whether trends you described are going to be confirmed or not in the current phase and, and whether anything will change or not in the Biden administration era. Um, then I would like to mention Jonathan and, and Matteo's similar approach to the topic of protecting of autonomous workers in the specific sector of, of legal and liberal professions. Uh, both papers uh, propose uh, innovative paths and interesting solutions to address uh, sectoral problems using a legal approach, but starting from a solid base of empirical evidence, data, and figures. Well done, Matteo. Well done, uh, Jonathan. Uh, my second point is quite simple, and is that uh, in a COVID-19 world, uh, we all have to find alternatives, uh, new ways. In short, we have to change our minds for the challenge of protection of autonomous work. And, and so I think we have to start with a simple question. Uh, what is labor law for? Uh, to put it simply, uh, labor law uh, was born basically to protect people, people who work and are therefore in a condition of weakness or, or at risk. Labor law was and is a way of regulating life and improving dignity of people. Uh, should we therefore now extend the scope of labor law in response to what needs? Should we do it through legislative intervention or maybe by supporting collective action and then collective bargaining? Uh, these are very, very difficult questions. As Merle's paper shows with respect to the case of Estonia and, and Finland, um, all the papers, however, uh, contain at least partial answer and an interesting proposal to tackle mentioned problems. I'm thinking about Merle's paper, but this is also true for Jonathan, Stephen and Matteo presentations. I personally I have many doubts about which is the right path to, to choose. And, and make the right decision. Uh, but uh, here uh, I would like to mention an option which our panelists explore to tell the truth only marginally or not directly as a tool for protecting autonomous work, uh, the active labor market policy approach. Uh, the COVID pandemic has a severe impact on societies and labor markets. However, not all countries, groups and, and sectors are equally affected. And it is still, of course, too early to evaluate the real success of strategies to cope with, with the problem. Uh, but a few uh, law and policy direction become apparent. And this includes, for, for sure, number one, as we all know, the use of digital tools to increase people's resilience and number two, a proper understanding of what works for income support and, and policy intervention. Uh, I think it's time to start to analyze these two directions in more si systemic ways. In their sectoral analysis, Matteo and, and Stephen uh, bring basic ideas and an indication to the table. Uh, there are, of course, significant cross-country differences in the labor market and the actual effect of the COVID-19 crisis on specific categories of workers also depends on the institutional setting in the respective country and on sectoral or occupational composition of the autonomous work. But one point seems to me of particular importance. Active labor market policies are generally complex policies, highly dependent on contextual factors and the quality of their implementation. Uh, vocational training and, and job search assistance um, are key component of active policies and they traditionally consist of information and assistance services delivered by advisors at, at employment agencies or, or job centers. And so, uh, which type of assistance is more effective for different types of job seeker, like the autonomous ones? Uh, recent economic studies show that low-cost interventions 
that provide tailored labor market information can improve search behavior and employment outcomes for some job seeker, even in the absence of labor intensive counseling or monitoring. In short, uh, vocational training and job search assistance programs could use digital tools for particular categories of workers and respond to the needs of autonomous workers. On the one hand, new policies designed to protect autonomous work should be based on the principle of temporary economic support. On the other hand, new initiatives aimed at supporting autonomous work should provide for direct and indirect conditionality measure with duties and obligation for beneficiaries of subsidies to accept uh, specific training initiatives or, or job opportunities. My point is that we have to explore more deeply which kind of support autonomous work needs in the next future. And this could be a good starting point for new research papers for scholars in different disciplines. That's it. Thank you for your attention. And I wish we could be together next year in Modena. Uh, thank you, Professor Salomone. And uh, uh, would you like to uh, reply to the comment of Professor Salomone? Yes, please. Uh, I just, sorry. <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank him for the comment. And um, I, I totally agree with you, the uh, interdisciplinary approach that we should use. Uh, also, I normally deal with organizational study and public administration studies. So for me, it was also really interesting to approach something more, uh, let's just say something closer to, to law, because who doesn't have uh, a law background normally doesn't really, um, you know, get some points. So it was a great opportunity also as a researcher to use an organizational approach to a, uh, let's just say, law issue. So I agree that we should use uh, always different approach. That, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, uh, if I may. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you as well, the professor, for the comments and for the intervention. Uh, I would say that I totally agree. So active labor, labor market policies are the other side of the coin that I would, uh, would have liked to explore in my paper. But uh, so <laughs> it, it would have been too long. But I agree that it is the, the other aspect that is fundamental to allow self-employed to stay in the labor market. When I decided what to put in the paper, I considered that maybe active labor market policies could be more useful for self-employed than for liberal professional that they have a specific way a specific uh, some specific topic to which they deal with so there are a slight difference in my opinion active labor market policies are an extraordinary instrument to support an, a self-employed that could also change the kind of job that he's doing or modify his kind of job for a liberal professional that in general took experience and uh, a license to practice in a specific field, maybe, and it was the idea that I sustained in the paper at the end, a most effective way is to try to keep him or her stay in the market as much as possible. So this is the difference, but I agree that active labor market policy are uh, so a field to explore and also their integration with digital tools is the new frontier of, uh, of social security measures and uh, income support measures in the labor market for this kind of workers. Oh, great. Thank you. And uh, do you have any uh, reply to the that uh, comment? Or okay? Well, if if and, um, uh, if we have a second, I would just like to briefly provide one response to uh, the professor's comments. I, I really like the framing of trying to remind individuals, but remind us that work pro work protections uh, have a strong tradition in trying to preserve dignity. And so one way to think about autonomous work is to figure out the relationship between autonomy and dignity and how the two ideas fit together. Uh, I would like to add a, a third sort of wrinkle to that, and that would be mobility 
and how mobility figures into dignity. This is how I often think about work as someone who studies immigration. So I think that's true in two senses. So one, so much of immigration law prohibits or prevents mobility. This is true in terms of the criminalization and relying on criminal law to regulate uh, different workers. Uh, I think, again, street vendors they have a hard time moving if you're subject to confrontation with the police. But then obviously immigration law generally does this with the kind of enforcement at the border, which means that numbers of people have come into the United States without authorization. And then they're stuck because they are afraid to leave and then not able to come back. So if you look at the statistics, the number of the percentage of unauthorized immigrants, there are 11 million unauthorized immigrants. With each passing year, the percentage who have been here for more than 10 years has just gone up. And it's not because they don't want to go back, but it's because they're, again, unable to, to come back and forth because of the costs associated, both economic and human. So things like mass legalization, something that the Biden administration is pushing, would, I think, do a lot economically, but also would do a lot in terms of mobility. The other area I think that could also solve mobility or advance mobility is to invest in development. So if you stabilize the economies uh, and the institutions of sending countries, then you get rid of the motivation to, to migrate in the first place. Uh, you know, so far, the United States has partnered with other countries primarily to enforce laws, to keep out asylees. But I think that if you could take that same idea and uh, expand the economic investment, uh, I think that, again, you would not have to use mobility as, as a metric in the United States because then we have, again, more stability in that regard as well. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, reply. And uh, yes, uh, if I may, yes, no, just uh, I would uh, I would like to thank as well Professor Salomone for the for the comments. And well, I will not repeat anything on the importance of the interdisciplinary approach, which is of course extremely useful. And I was very interested in all the presentations that followed. And I, I have also part of my family living in California, so I was actually very interested because it's something that I really had no idea about uh, immigrants entrepreneurship uh, in, in California. So thank you very much. And only one comment uh, is uh, on well, the tendencies and the strategies. Uh, at one point, uh, I think it becomes also a matter of po political options. And then it goes be, be all behind uh, uh, every consideration that has a scientific base because it, became, it becomes really a matter of political options. And my fear as an Italian citizen and not and as a lawyer is that while we have a very high level in, uh, of quality in the academical debate, in the legal sector and outside, my fear is that we do not have the same quality in the political debate. And uh, so this is maybe something that we will have to deal with uh, not only in the conferences and in research, but in everyday life uh, as citizens and members of a, of a community. But of course, this becomes another conference. Next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, because of my uh, poor time management and uh, some troubles, we have uh, uh, almost uh, no time uh, to use for my uh, workshop. So uh, I I'd like to conclude uh, my uh, session, uh, unfortunately, uh, and uh, 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 so I apologize uh, uh, for my uh, 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 poor uh, management. So, I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much for your uh, good uh, presentations of uh, all the speakers. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, patience for the audience uh, instead of uh, some troubles and uh, 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 bad time uh, management. So. I'd like to conclude my uh, 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 workshop, and and uh, I I hope you uh, you are uh, 
good uh, health uh, because uh, the COVID-19 will uh, unfortunately continue for some time uh, in the near future. It's, uh, and anyway, uh, thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Uh, uh,